This episode of Geeks Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Rachel B., who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 425 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Arkady Martin. She holds a Ph.D. in Byzantine history and works as a policy analyst for the state of New Mexico, focusing on climate mitigation and energy policy. And we'll be speaking with her today about her debut novel, A Memory Called Empire, about an ambassador to a galaxy-spanning civilization who investigates the murder of her predecessor. And now here's our interview with Arkady Martin. All right, so we're here with Arkady Martin. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So in the acknowledgement of a memory called Empire, you say, to my father, Ira Weller, who gave me science fiction to begin with when I was too small to know better. So tell us about that. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, my dad is a science fiction fan. um, And basically, my house when I was growing up was full of paperbacks from the 60s, 70s, 80s, like those old Bayon paperbacks, um, the ones that by the time I got them, they had pretty yellow pages. And I was an unbelievably voracious reader. As a small child, if there was written material, I would read it. So I started reading science fiction probably, if you count Alice in Wonderland, which is not really science fiction, but I definitely read that when I was about four. Um, And dad gave me like, Isaac Asimov of the Foundation series, probably way too young when I think about it now. I was about eight. Uh I read Dune at about 11. Uh, So, yeah. Uh, And I still now, um, my dad is the first person who gets to read my books after my editor and my agent and my wife. Um, But he's, I think, the only person right now who owns a printed copy of the sequel to A Memory Called Empire. Uh It's been part of our relationship since I was tiny. So were those books you mentioned the ones that made the biggest impression on you or were there other ones that you would say were um you know most formative for you? Um Dune definitely was really formative. I probably Asimov not really except in the kind of background radiation way. Um of stuff I've read early that was really formative for me probably Guy Gabriel K all of that Gabriel K, but I started with the Theon of Our Tapestry series, again, very young. Um, and he was a big influence on actually my current writing style, though I had to go through a period of doing it badly first. Uh, he has a very lyrical writing style with a real interesting command of omniscient and the use of sort of a mythic tonality. And if you look at the stuff I was writing when I was 18 or 19, which I hope you never do, (laughs) it's that done terribly. Um, But I love his work still very, very much. So were you into, it sounds like you were into fantasy and science fiction both pretty equally or? Pretty equally. Um, I still have trouble sort of sorting them out in a strange way. There's a very small um literary convention that i'm on the board of called fourth street fantasy where one of the rules of fourth street fantasy is that fantasy is the word for science fiction and fantasy and i sometimes reverse that and think that science fiction encompasses most of the fantasy i like anyway because it's about exploring ideas concepts and themes that you can intensify by taking them out of the constraints of the quote unquote real. Yeah. In this thing about your dad, you say, let there always be more quote science affliction for both of us. Is that a <laughs> yeah. private joke? Or? It's an in joke. Yeah. Um, 
so my mom is not a big science fiction reader. She's a, a big reader, but not a big science fiction reader. So she used to call my dad and I uh, our mutual obsession with pulp sci-fi as science affliction. Um, so it's just the family in joke. Uh -huh. And so your your pen name, Arkady, um, is that a reference to Arkady Stragatsky or? It's not actually, um, though it's certainly an association that I am very happy about, but um, it's actually a reference to a character in a book called Spin State by Chris Moriarty, which is a extremely good sci-fi novel that was published, I believe, in the early 2000s. Um, in that book, there are several characters named Arkady because they are all clones. And I love that book. And I found it to be a hilarious joke to name myself after a clone, essentially. Hmm. Was there any particular reason you wanted to use a pen name rather than using your, your real name? Yeah. Um, at the time, I was finishing a PhD in medieval history, Byzantine history to be specific, and I thought I was going to spend most of my career in the academy. And I was operating under the assumption that it would be more difficult to get tenure and get published academically if I also had a whole bunch of science fiction written under my own name. Um, I think none of those assumptions were true, starting with that I was going to spend the rest of my <laughs> life in the academy. Um, but also in the time between 2012, which is when I first published something under this pen name, and even 2017, which is the last time I worked for a major research university, the amount of times that I was able to access an opportunity or make connections either professionally, personally, or intellectually because of the overlap between my work as a writer and my work as an academic surprised me to the point where I just stopped trying to use a pseudonym as any kind of shield. For a while, I used it as Google disambiguation, and I still sort of do that. If you Google Anna Linden Weller, which is my legal name, um, you're going to mostly find me as a Byzantinist and me as a climate and energy policy person. So if that's what you're looking for, you get that first. <laughs> and if you're looking for the science fiction, you Google Arkady Martin and you get all the science fiction first. And that I do like still very much. Like that kind of, you can find what you want. Yeah. So you said you started publishing stuff in 2012. Kind of what was what was going on? Like, how did you get started publishing? Um, I had been writing fan fiction for, I don't know, ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and some friends of mine. Like fan, what, who fan were fiction also, for what? Fan fiction. Um, lots of stuff. Let's see. Farscape, Harry Potter. Um a whole bunch of weird anime at one point. Hmm. Uh, I used to write very careful pastiche of my favorite novels for a uh, fan fiction exchange that happened every sort of Christmas time called Yuletide. And I got pretty good at pastiche for that. Um, so I, I had been doing that forever and I had written, tried to write several sort of original novels and they had never worked and I kind of wanted to see if I could just do it once like write something that could be professionally published I had at this point not only made friends in fandom who were writers and serious writers and I think fan fiction writers can be very very serious about craft and I think it's a incredibly interesting craft place to work on writing and to think about writing. But also I had um, become quite close friends with some people who were writing professionally. Uh, so I started to get a sense of what the landscape was. And... How, how did you make friends with those people? <laughs> um, so the author Elizabeth Bear and I started talking on live journal in live journal comments when I was 18, which is hilarious because we've now been friends for almost half my life. Hmm. Uh, 
but you, uh, the, the internet is the answer. That's how I learned about how this community worked. I was not really a person who went to conventions and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And so, uh, so you, sorry, so, so sorry, I interrupted you. So you were saying that you, you wanted to write something that, um, you know, would be published. I wanted to write something original and I wanted to see if I could, if I was good enough. Um, and I was also kind of hitting a point where I realized that the kind of fan fiction I was writing was basically original stuff anyway. Um, and that that was what I was interested in was not the, either the aesthetic pleasure of playing in a story world that you already know, which is why I still read fan fiction, um, or making an argument about that world, which is why I originally started writing fan fiction. But I just kept writing things that might as well have been original. And I, these, I have... These are uh, short stories to... Short stories. All yeah. of this is short stories. Yeah. Um, the first thing I published was a story called Lace Downstairs, which is cyberpunk pastiche. Um, I'm, I still like it, <laughs> but it's, it, I would consider it kind of the, the last of the real juvenilia. It doesn't really sound like me. It sounds like me pretending to be William Gibson. And I'm a lot better at pretending to be William Gibson now than I was in 2012. <laughs> So how did you kind of um, make that transition from writing short stories to, to working on a novel? I didn't do that for a while. I published a lot of short stories um, before I thought about working on a novel. And the short story length is actually probably closer to my natural idiom. Um, I finished my PhD dissertation in 2014. And promptly decided that if I wasn't working on something enormous and difficult, I clearly wasn't going to know what to do with myself. So it was time to write a novel. Uh, <laughs> I kind of dared myself to do it. I do a lot of stuff like that, I guess. Um, I wanted to see if I had figured out how to, because I'd never managed it before. I had never managed to sustain anything longer than about 15,000 words at that point. So the hardest part about writing a novel was, in fact, that it goes on for so long. <laughs> and there's just you have to be committed to a project for so long and work on it all the time. That's you, still the hardest thing about writing novels. Do you, do you remember what the first kind of spark of inspiration was for Memory Called Empire? Yeah, there were two. Um, one of them is basically that what I worked on in my PhD dissertation was about Byzantine and Armenian diplomats and borderlands. And I was deeply obsessed with the kind of cultural assimilation and culture clash that happens in border spaces. And of course I was obsessed with it. You have to be obsessed with what you write your dissertation on, otherwise you're never gonna finish it. But one of the things that's difficult to do in an academic writing context is to be emotionally involved and emotionally compelled by a theme or a question. And I was emotionally compelled by ideas of assimilation, ideas of liminal spaces, and the people who move through those and how they negotiate their own identity. And there's a story, well, it's not really a story, except for that all history is stories. Um, about Petros Getadaj, who was the head of the Armenian church, the Catholicos, um, in the 11th century, early 11th century. And he was, he essentially negotiated with the Byzantine emperor at the time to prevent the Byzantine takeover of the Armenian church. And to do so, he handed sovereignty of an Armenian city, um, the city of Ani, which was basically a, a little kingdom over to the Byzantine. So I got deeply fascinated by what it, what's it like to be that guy, the guy who betrays your culture to save your culture? Like, where's that? What, what on earth is that like, like hmm. that choice? Um, 
so that was kind of some of the impetus for writing memory. Like I wanted to tell that story, but tell it with all of the emotional valence that it made me feel um, and all of my complicated feelings about empire and horror and beauty. And I also had a piece of unfinished, not very good attempt at a novel that ha had one one good concept in it. Uh, and this is from my early 20s, so it had been like on a shelf for years. Um, and the one good concept was basically a diplomat comes to a foreign country and has the ghost of her predecessor in her head. In the original, it was actually a ghost. It was a fantasy, not <laughs> a, not science fiction. Well, yeah, I can I can definitely you know see how those ideas you know came together in this book, and I'll, I want to get into some of that stuff. I also want to ask you though, um, in the acknowledgments, you um, you say to Liz Burke who accidentally sold this book. I was just wondering uh, <laughs> yeah. how how did that happen accidentally? Liz is a reviewer um, and a good friend, um, and again, this is sort of a publishing in joke, I guess. So I had finished the book and I was about to query it to agents to find a literary agent. And Liz had read it um, as part of my like internal critique before I was ready to send it out. And she asked me if she could be pleased about it on Twitter. Um, and I said, sure, why not? Not really realizing that if uh, someone who reviews for Locus and Tor.com is something like, I'm really, really enthused about this book that is not only unpublished, but unagented. It might mean that you end up with an offer from a publisher, which made the process of getting agents much faster. <laughs> so accidentally sold the book. So, so an, an editor from Tor emailed you and no, said... No, 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 no. Different, different publisher. Oh, I'm sorry. I ended up with a different publisher than um, the very initial offer that I got. Okay. Um, but so an, an editor reached out to you and yeah. then asked to see the manuscript or... Yes. Okay. An editor reached out to me and asked to see the manuscript. And of course, I showed that editor the manuscript. Um, that editor later, I mean, like five days later, made an offer on the manuscript upon which I said, hang on, I need an agent. And uh, I had been, I had sent the, the manuscript to several agents. And at that point, I contacted them again and said, hey, guys, can you tell me if you're interested in representing this? Because I need help right now. And that's how I ended up with my current agent, Dong Wan Song, who is brilliant and a fantastic agent for me. Yeah, that's really, and that's a lot easier than, uh, you know, I know so many people who I'm not waited good years example. to hear back from. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not publishers. a good example. When <laughs> when people who are trying to publish their first books, like I, I've been on a couple of panels at like conventions where they're like, debut authors, tell your publishing story. And like, I don't want to know. Like, I'm this is weird. This is not how it usually goes. It was incredibly lucky. I mean, I wrote a good book, but there's a lot of good books out there. I was incredibly lucky in terms of process. Yeah, well, that's really cool. So, so yeah, so the book, again, it's called A, a Memory Called Empire. And it's set in this um, space opera kind of empire called Texcalon. And my initial impression uh, was the Texcalon. It was sort of like the Aztec Empire plus the um, Imperial Cult of Sol Invictus. Is that pretty, is that pretty accurate? You are sixty five percent right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll take I'll take that. Yeah. So yes, there's a ton of influence from uh, the Aztecs, but and there is in a weird way a lot of influence from Sol Invictus, which is a Roman sun cult. If you advance Romans all the way up through Byzantium, um, a lot of the cultural touchstones of Texcalan including some of the ones that seem really weird, like the poetry battles, are in fact medieval Byzantine, lifted nearly straight up. So those two are the big influences, plus there's some kind of Pax Mongolica 
things and a hell of a lot of American imperialism also. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so, so the, but, but they both, I guess, you know, um, the Aztecs and Solon Victus kind of worship the sun or consider the sun a, a god in a way. And mm. I know the, the Aztecs had human sacrifice. And so there is a sort of human sacrifice aspect to, to Texcoan. Um, sort of, where did that idea come from that you wanted the sort of, I guess, I guess well, in the first case, the sun and the human sacrifice kind of stuff in the space opera sort of setting. Yeah. So, um, the Texcalanli don't exactly worship the sun. They worship stars, which is sometimes equates to worshiping the sun. Uh, and yes, they are historically a human sacrifice religion. Um, they're also a luck religion. And one of the reasons that I chose those thematic strands to use as I was constructing this religion was that I had used so much of Byzantium to think about how I was putting together the space empire, but I didn't want it to feel like Byzantium. I didn't want to do yet another rendition of Rome and space. And to try to get away from it, the thing I had to cut out was the fundamental Christianity and monotheism of the Byzantine Empire, which is one of its deep central ideological facets. So I needed to excise that to get away from, because I didn't want this to feel like any one particular culture, because it's not, I'm not writing about future Byzantium or future Aztecs. Uh, there's influences. So I reached for other ways of constructing religion and cultural cohesion for a universalist empire. And one of the ones I found was sacrifice religion and almost every culture worships suns or stars in one way or another. I'm also interested in, uh, and this is one of the things that if I say it, it's going to sound very strange. I'm interested in human sacrifice. Um, <laughs> not so much in the sense of like the actual dying people on altars and things, but in terms of what are people willing to give up? And in what ways are those choices institutionalized and commanded? So that became part of what I was working with in the plot line of a memory called empire. I mean, it seems like there's sort of two implicit models of history in most science fiction. One would be kind of the Star Trek model of progress where, you know, things were worse in the past and they're going to be better in the future. And then the other would be kind of like history is sort of a cycle and, you know, Rome rose in the past and something similar might rise again in the future. And would you say that you have any particular, um, I mean, obviously, you know, in this this book is more more the latter, but um, is that just because you think it's cool and dramatic to write about, or do you see that is that sort of how you envision the future? That's my as a historian, as someone who's trained as a historian, has worked as a historian. I definitely do not see progress as linear in any way. Um, progress is context dependent, cyclical, and a moving target. Also, I don't know. I mean, Star Trek is great and all, but I don't buy it. We're too complicated <laughs> humans, I mean. Uh, I, I don't know how we get there. I don't know how you ever get a straight line of it just gets better in the future. In some places, it's better. In some places, it's worse. And the nature of better and worse changes over time. Um. I'm very glad to be alive in 2020 when there is stuff like antibiotics and chemotherapy. And at the same time, sometimes I would have really liked to have been alive in other centuries where the scope of my opportunities would have been different in ways that interest me. I mean, do you think that we might go back to human sacrifice without, you know, if, if technology keeps progressing, that you could have something like human sacrifice or witch burning or something like that come back, even in a sort of continually functional, um, increasingly yes. technological society. Why would that be impossible? I mean, morality is 
I personally think that this would be a terrible idea, but <laughs> just just to be um, clear for listeners. Yeah, uh, well, I, I mean, we're talking about some the difference between what are humans capable of defining as a successful and morally righteous society, and what do does any one author or person find a successful and morally righteous society? That gap is real wide in a lot of different directions. Um, but yeah, technology does not eliminate brutality or the deeply personal nature of someone's relationship with religion. So if you could be a tourist to Texcalon, would you want to go? Yes. Um, <laughs> So the deep secret of this book, which is not really a secret because I think I've said it in previous interviews, is that I wrote an empire that would absolutely be bait for me personally. I made it catnip. And then I made it horrible because that felt like the only way to like deal with the fact that I had made it catnip for me. <laughs> but oh my God, yes. Um, it's gorgeous. It's full of people who care about history and literature and people speak in poetry and care about referentiality and their politics are terrible, but where are politics not terrible? Um, they have fantastic reproductive health care, really beautiful architecture. They have basically completely solved um, climate change and energy issues. Yeah, why wouldn't I want to go? Hmm. I mean, I'd probably be really sad there because Texcalan only really is Texcalan for Texcalanism. That's the point. But yeah, I'd want to go. I mean, poetry plays a really central role in this culture. And I was just curious if you're, are you a poet or are you involved in the poetry world or, or anything like that? I've published a couple of poems, but I would not call myself a poet. Um, I read poetry. I enjoy it very much. I every so often manage to write a decent poem, but it is not, I don't know how that happens when it happens. <laughs> I, I'm good at writing craft. I'm not good at poetry craft. Uh, but nothing of the poetry in A Memory Called Empire is not something that poetry does right now in the world we live in. Poetry is so often a political act. Poetry is so often a way of communicating memory um, and creating emotional effects. Protest poetry, protest songs, um, memorial poetry, none of this is new. None of this is stuff I made up. You know, years ago, there, there are these two podcasts, um, History of Rome and 12 Byzantine Rulers, that I, I listened to the whole run of it. It was a long time ago, so I don't remember all the details. But one thing that really stuck with me is that there was this story about this emperor who was um, sort of being overthrown and fled to the um, docks and wanted to get on a ship to escape. And the guards wouldn't let him because they were afraid that they would be blamed for letting him escape by the mm -hmm. by the next emperor. And they quoted to him uh, a line from the Iliad that goes, um, like, is it such a bad thing to die or something like that? Uh-huh. And I've just always I loved that think... idea of a society yeah. where just even the guards at the dock will just quote the Iliad to you uh, extemporaneously. Well, either the guards at the dock quoted the Iliad extemporaneously or the particular historian who was writing the account <laughs> yeah. of that usurpation wanted them to. Both are possibly true. It's the second one that interests me, though. Like, mm. why is that a cultural marker of prestige and nobility? What does that say about a society? Yeah. So that was one example. And then another thing that this made me think of regarding the centrality of poetry is one time uh, I, I went to see a lecture by a, a you know American who had served in the Vietnam War. And he had gone back to Vietnam, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, years later, something like that. And had spoken to to one of the um, people who had been fighting on the other side, and mm -hmm. um, and this guy from Vietnam said to him, "Oh, so what sort of poetry did you write when you were fighting?" You know. Oh wow. And just like all the, I guess all the Viet Cong, that was one of the things that the soldiers all did was they were all encouraged to write 
poetry and little journals in the trenches and um, caves and stuff. And that's just so different from what you would think of American soldiers would ever, would ever be doing. Well, I think there are probably American soldiers who do do it, but it's not culturally mandated like what you're describing. Uh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that at all about the Viet Cong. Yeah. Did you ever, do you ever go to um, poetry slams or rap battles or things like that? I have. Um, I, there's, sort of, there's a scene sort of like that in, in the book. There's a scene, yeah. It's not my scene, really, um, which is, I think, my own problem more than the scene's problem. Um, I tend to like, on a personal aesthetic level, more polished things. What I have found deeply inspiring is hearing the kinds of poetry and spoken word performance which occur at civil rights protests that's where it feels live to me mm -hmm. how about this idea that the the text clone litzlam don't smile or they smile very sort of reservedly where did that come from um i don't know i I wanted to do something about different styles of facial expression and gesture. And I sort of landed on that randomly, but there's a lot of variation in human cultures on what kinds of facial expressions are the kinds of facial expressions that are acceptable um, or used commonly and which ones are uncomfortable to look at. I mean, Almost all human cultures smile in some way, but Americans tend to smile with their teeth exposed, and that is not universal at all. Um, so it's a variant, and the Texcalan leads them are shoved way off into one edge of that variation, but it's not that far away from some cultural practices that exist. Yeah, I mean, I've heard uh, women in Japan, if they, many of times, if they laugh, will kind of cover their mouths, which is, uh, I guess, I modest, don't modest. know if that's like, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was that the um, we we're told that there are aliens in this universe, um, but mm -hmm. they don't appear as characters on stage. Really, I was wondering if you um, if that was a conscious choice, or did you ever think about having alien characters or how did that kind of idea form? Well, if you wait for book two. Um, <laughs> lots, lots of alien characters in yeah. book two. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, well, there were two things that I was playing with. There are, there are at least two kinds of sentient. Well, there's at least one kind of sentient and one probably sentient group of non-humans in memory. Um, the Iberecti, who are, I sort of think of them as kind of like weird carnivorous horses with brains. Uh, <laughs> and I wanted there to have been a first contact experience in the past of this empire um, that was actually at this point pretty normalized, um, but also had ended in a kind of detent where they divided up the universe and they don't really spend a lot of time together. Um, and the reason that I wanted that to be there was that there's this other group of non-humans who are, at least in a memory called Empire, extremely unknown and very dangerous and unpleasant and threatening. And I wanted to have that not be the first time that humans had encountered an intelligent group of aliens in this universe. I did that for plot reasons that are visible in the second book, which sadly I'm not going to spoil. <laughs> but so the uh, so why are there no Abrecti living in Tyxgalon or or humans living in with the Abrecti? Is that because uh, they're just two different morph morphologically? Or I mean, there probably are a few. It wasn't something that figured largely in the story I was writing, primarily because the action of A Memory Called Empire takes place 
in a highly urbanized area and the Ibrekti are really not very urban at all. They are sort of permanently nomadic, um, which doesn't mean they aren't incredibly technologically advanced, but Ibrekti would be pretty uncomfortable in the capital city of Texcalan just because there isn't a lot of room. Um, they're also larger. They're, I mean, think about horses. <laughs> well, right. We're talking about but, a, a city that covers most of the planet or the majority yeah, of the planet. Um, most, the majority oceans are oceans and there are places which are designated agricultural or um, ecological areas. But the, the jewel of the world is an incredibly managed place. It is certainly not how most planets look like in the Texcalonli Empire, um, but it is a particularly urbanized area. I mean, Mahid at one point in the book, I think, thinks to herself that the um, Texcalon covers, what was it, a quarter of the galaxy? Is that... Uh, is that... Yeah, that's about right. Um, in terms of, it's a little hard to measure space in this universe because of the way that I've set up the um, version of fast and light travel, which are jump gates. So, which are kind of like wormholes, but they only go from place A to place B, and you don't know where place A is in relationship to place B. So, of known space where people live Pixcalon hmm. covers about a quarter of the of that area but it's not a contiguous area in any way so is it like a, a milky way sized galaxy or is it a, a smaller galaxy or i have no idea <laughs> this is not something it, here, here's a, a terrible secret i'm not one of those people who world builds anything i don't immediately need um, and I don't know how big the galaxy is, or if it's multiple galaxies. The way the jump gates work, they could be bouncing all over the universe, basically. I thought the, I thought the book, um, you know, all comes together in the end incredibly well. Um, Thank you. Considering if you if you were sort of um, you know making making it up kind of as you were going to some to some extent. I mean, it, I wouldn't have known that. I don't think from reading it. Well, it's not exactly that I make things up as I go along, though I do do that. It's that I don't do a lot of preparatory work unless I know I'm going to need it for something. Like, in terms of how the jump gates work, I spent a lot of time working that out. Um, the rules for it was what's important to me as a writer and as a reader of speculative fiction is that the author does not break their own rules. If something is stated, it cannot be broken without the breaking being explicable. What, what would but what would be some of the like the main rules that would make your jump gates jump different gates? than yeah, like other jump gates? Or um, I'm sure that there that other jump gates also work like this. But <laughs> mine are one to one. So if you have jump gate A, it goes to place B. And you can go from B to A back again, but you can't go from anywhere else. Jump gate A only takes you to place B and the other side of it only takes you to place A. Those two places do not have to be anywhere near each other at all. Um, and there may be jump gates that are in clusters that could take you to a bunch of different places, or you might only have one in a very large area and within that area, if you're not going through the jump gate, you have to work at sublight speed. Um, that and I made some decisions about how communication worked, which was you can have something like Ansible like, like FTL communication within an area, but that FTL communication won't pass through a jump gate. You have to physically carry something. Uh, so, so, so the instantaneous communication has a limited range? Yes. Yeah. Instantaneous communication does not go through a jump gate. If you want to communicate through a jump gate, you have to have a physical recording and carry it to the other side upon which you can have instantaneous communication again. I guess we should explain it's important, you know, the jump gates and everything, because um, the action of the book is, is split a little bit between the central 
Imperial planet. Um, and then the, this, uh, culture called the stationers who live on space stations kind of in, mm -hmm. in deep space. Um, yeah. do you want to talk about, you know, what, what the process was like of creating those two different cultures, um, for this novel? Yeah. So, um, if Texcalan is built out of America, the Aztecs and the Byzantines, uh, the stationers are built out of Armenia, medieval Armenia, and every single generation ship novel I've ever read. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I love generation ships. They are one of my favorite ideas in science fiction. And I'm really interested in the kinds of societies that get built when you have a small population that is self-sustaining, but can't get away from itself and can't really increase beyond a certain level. So I'm interested in what happens culturally in that kind of islanding situation. And when I built LaSalle uh, and the other stations, I they're basically a generation ship that stopped <laughs> um, for various reasons. One of them being that they found a whole lot of mineral resources um, and the other ones being that they ran out of fuel. Hmm. But this happened a very long time in their past and it's somewhat obscure historically even to them, like exactly how they stopped. But I wanted to write about people who were incredibly limited in their ability to expand beyond a certain point and who lived in a highly dangerous place. Um, and the question that kept coming up for me was, how do you keep institutional knowledge going in that situation when you don't have a lot of spares, first of all? And second of all, it's likely that people might die early of accident or solar radiation cancer or malnutrition or someone opening an airlock. Where's your failsafe? Can you build one? And because it's science fiction, I get to come up with one, which is the imago process, which is basically a way of preserving institutional memory cross generationally, where you have the memory and some of the personality as a kind of epiphenomena of the person who used to have your job put in your head when you take that job so that you never lose institutional knowledge. Um, it sounds simultaneously semi-utopian and extremely dystopian, which it's meant to. And one of the fun things about playing with that idea is thinking about then, if that's your baseline, how does it go wrong? In what ways can it go wrong? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I, one of the passages I found most fascinating in, in the book is uh, Mahita's thinking back on what's considered ethical and unethical on LaSalle. And she mm -hmm. thinks that, you know, sometimes people will kind of hold on to the recorded memories of their loved ones rather than letting them be transferred to a new person, sort of like you would hold on to somebody's ashes in an urn or something because of the sort of uh, emotional or sentimental value. And that this is just unethical because then it's not um, those skills aren't yeah. being used by the by the group. Um, and then also that sometimes people will attempt to um, strike up relationships with the spouse of the person whose memories they've absorbed because that person, I guess, is sort of more, you know, emotionally vulnerable to, um, to this, this relationship and that that scene is, um, you know, exploitative or, uh, you know, taking yeah. advantage of the person. And I just thought those were really well worked out kind of science fictional extrapolations of this, um, you know, this memory recording technology. Thank you. Um, it's important to me to think about how cultures would develop ethics in science fictional situations that not just do you have this weird, amazing new technology that allows a society to function very differently, but if a society is functioning very differently, you're going to have different ethics, different considerations of what's moral and immoral, um, different modes of punishment, different senses of what is an okay way to exist. Um, and I tried to build that for both LaSalle and for Texcalan and to differentiate them pretty profoundly. Yeah. I mean, one of the conversations I thought was really interesting was that um, the the characters are thinking that 
you know, your memories are not the sum total of who you are as a person. And um, I think a lot of science fiction sort of implicitly suggests that, that it is. Like I'm thinking of the movie Total Recall, for example, where the idea mm -hmm. is like, oh, if you just overwrite Arnold Schwarzenegger's memories with different memories, he's a different person. And, you know, there's just this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between memories and personhood. And, um, and I think you're right, you're, you're right, or the book is right, that that's not the case. And I, I don't know if I'd ever really seen a, a discussion of that in science fiction before. I'm not the only one. Um, I have an immediate antecedent and several contemporaries who are working on the same concepts. Uh, the immediate antecedent is C.J. Cherry in uh, her book, Cytine, which in many ways thinks through a lot of the same ideas that I'm thinking through with Imago technology using a completely different technological basis. Um, but the idea of how much of someone's personality and memory is genetically determined, physically determined, and how much of it is experiential. Um, and also, I have spent a lot of time reading about neuroplasticity and memory formation and things like epigenetic trauma, uh, where traumatic events that happened to your recent ancestors can show up in the way you react to things that have never actually happened to you. Um, and this is scientifically very, very substantiated um, that there are genetic changes and tendencies that can be passed from people who are physically or emotionally traumatized to their children. Uh, without those children being physically or emotionally traumatized themselves. And so memory and personality is such a complicatedly intertwined thing with physicality and experience. Um, personally, I don't think that I would be the same person if I had a different physiology. I might have some of the same traits. I'd probably have quite a few of the same traits if I had the same parents and grew up in the same place and time. But had I been born in a uh, male sexed body, I would be a different person than the person I am now. Um, just to pick one example. Yeah, well, I, I think for listeners, maybe a, a way to explain it is if you and I were to swap all our memories, the question then is, does it mean that your mind is in my body and my mind is in your body? Or is it that my mind is in my body with your memories and your mind is in your body with your memories? And I think option B is, is the one that's correct. It's yeah. A... Um, basically, I would think that if we swapped immediately there would be some degree of blur between the experiences that your body has had in the time you've been alive and the way that you physiologically um, react to things and how my set of memories would interpret those reactions and vice versa. And that blur is kind of what I'm playing with, with the Imago technology. Like, even if you add someone's memory and skill set, what does that memory and skill set do in a completely different physiological response context? Right. You said that there are, you, you said there are contemporaries too, who are dealing with some of these same questions. Yeah. Um, in different ways, uh, Elizabeth Bearer's most recent science fiction novel, uh, Ancestral Night plays a lot with ideas of what, what is the nature of a person if they don't remember what they did, or they turned off some kind of emotional regulation that is linked up to their physiology. Um, are they the same person? Or are they still responsible for what they did previously? Um, and actually that question, the question of responsibility for actions taken when you were 
functioning under a very different physiological regime is one that, I mean, there's Richard Morgan, who I think like, played with this a lot and in the um, uh, Takeshi Kovacs novels. I'm trying to remember yeah, the name altered, of the first one carbon. now. Altered Carbon, yeah. Um, though he goes in a very different direction than how I've gone for it. Um, and also to return to something that I, I spoke about earlier, um, that that novel I got the pen name from, Spin State, those many, many clones are all different people, but they have the same starting point. And one of the things that that book explores, and especially its direct sequel explores, is how how different can people who are physiologically the same end up? I mean, in an interview, I heard you talk about, I had never heard of this. I thought this was fascinating. You said that there was a singer called Dessa who oh, yeah. was trying to get over, um, you know, someone she broke up with and with the aid of an MRI machine to sort of, I guess, see what was, what was working and what wasn't in her brain uh, in terms mm -hmm. of um, coping mechanisms. Um, she wrote, a memoir about it, uh, which is a fantastic book. Uh, it's called My Own Devices. And it talks a lot about the physiological nature of romantic love. And also about like the idea of deciding that you don't want to be physiologically stuck with particular emotional reactions anymore and what you might do about it. Um, I think based on the memoir and I, while I have met Dessa, I have met her for about two minutes after a concert. So I don't know her at all. Hmm. Um, I think based on the memoir that she might call the experiment a success, that it was in fact freeing that she could look at the memories and emotions that this particular person evoked in her with a greater degree of dispassion that would allow her to sort of unstick that part of her life, which I think is neat. Also terrifying, but neat. It's, and it's neat that she kind of just did that on her own initiative. And I don't know if anyone has done something similar or followed up on that, but it, I mean, it seems like it would have a lot of um, potential for you know, for treatments and things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think she discovered it because it had been used as a treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, but it probably has a very wide range of possible therapeutic effects. I can also think of a very wide range of extremely negative um uses for such a technology. I also just want to mention this one detail uh, about LaSalle um, that I really liked. So I always like these kinds of details in science fiction, but when Mahit, who, who grew up on LaSalle on the space station, the first morning that she's in um, Tykes Galan, she sees the sun coming through the windows and she sees all the dust motes floating in the air. And she thinks like, oh, that's interesting because she's grown up on a space station where the air was much more filtered. And so mm -hmm. she's never seen this this effect before. And I, I just love details like that where it's it's really thinking through, you know, what is this person's, you know, experience and, and how would they see things that we would consider normal because um, you know, they've had a completely alien experience. Yeah, uh, I love doing those little things. Because in A Memory Called Empire, you only get Mahit's point of view like 98% of the time <laughs> her sensorium and her experiences needed to be really, really distinct and clear. And that kind of little detail is the sort of thing I find really, really fun to play with. Like what's different. What would you notice if you came from a extremely foreign environment to something as normal as, morning sunlight through a hotel room. Yeah, no, I think that's really cool. Um, so yeah, I listened to a bunch of interviews with you and it sounds like you've moved around quite a bit, but I think, are you currently in Santa Fe? Is that? I am. Yeah. 
Um, I've always wanted to go to Santa Fe because uh, that's where Roger Zelazny lived, who was my favorite author growing up. But <laughs> I've never made it there. But um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, you said, um, have you connected with any of the like? Because I think there's a pretty great science fiction scene there. I don't there know. is, and I have sadly been prevented from getting in as involved in it as I'd like by this goddamn pandemic. Um, <laughs> I only moved here last September, um, and only uh, sort of finished moving here in December when my wife uh, got to leave her job and come join me. So I had just started really like going out for drinks with the other incredibly cool people here when suddenly we couldn't socialize anymore. So I'm looking forward to that in the future because yeah. um, there is an amazing community here. Yeah, that's a real bummer. Like, who did you because like, um, like Melinda Snodgrass has been on the show um, uh -huh. a bunch of times. And, um, and Ian Tregillis and Rebecca Roanhorse uh, and... I mean, George R. R. Martin lives here, obviously, but there's a big community. Yeah. Do you go to his um his theater? The um, I'm trying to think what the name of it is. Um, you know, he bought this uh, movie theater I, and yes. turned it into a bookstore and stuff. I would like to, but this <laughs> damn pandemic. Yeah. yeah. I don't do anything anymore. I do my day job and I write books and I sit in my house. That's all I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, so actually, speaking of your day job, you do some something involving climate mitigation. Is that right? Yeah, I'm the policy advisor to the cabinet secretary for the Department of Energy, Minerals and Natural Resources of the state of New Mexico, which all sounds very like official and stuff. But um, basically, I, I'm a policy analyst. I mostly work in energy policy climate mitigation and adaptation um, and some regulatory stuff about like mining and mine reclamation and uh, oil and gas regulation for the oil and gas industry, which is a prominent industry in New Mexico. I mean, do you feel like um, like working in that job that you've learned things about climate mitigation that you know more people should should be aware of? That's an interesting question. Um, because the answer could probably take another hour of <laughs> podcast. I'm trying to come up with like a, a simple thing because what I have learned about. Like do people have misconceptions about your job or anything like that? Like, or, you know, things that you um, want to correct? I think that people have misconceptions that um, those of us who are trying to do this job on the government side are deliberately moving too slowly. We are moving as absolute fast as we can drag this very heavy ship to turn around um please give be a little patient with us we're trying uh but there's a lot of inertia to push against which is not to say that we haven't done amazing things in new mexico in just the past two years like the uh our governor michelle Lujan grisham uh in her third executive order of her term um set new uh renewable energy standards for the state where we will be uh, net zero carbon by 2050 for all utilities, 2045 for investor owned utilities. Um, and that was pushed into law with the Energy Transition Act, which was passed in 2019, which um, has really important mandates for a just transition. So if you have a coal plant that closes, then the people who work there have to be compensated and retrained as part of the utilities cost recovery program. I'm simplifying this <laughs> enormously, but yeah. some of the stuff we're doing here is pretty amazing. And we have done so much in the past two years, but we started from zero and we have gotten this engine going and now we just have to keep going. Do, um, do climate change and climate mitigation show up in your science fiction at all? More so now, as it's what I spend every day on. Uh, this is a thing that is true of whatever work I'm doing. Whatever I'm interested in ends up showing up in my work. Um, the novel that I'm currently writing, which is called Prescribed Burn, which is not a Texcalan novel. Um, it's set in a future American Southwest, and it is about 
drought and wildfires and water politics and what might happen if all of these smart utility grids we're building woke up. Um, so I think that's, that, that I, it's not a climate change novel, but it's a novel that I could not write if I wasn't deeply immersed in this stuff. Is there a, uh, like a, um, a, a release date for that yet? Um, there's a tentative one, um, which is I think late 2022. Okay. So it's got uh, some time. a while away yet. Yeah. I just started writing it. Um, and you have another Texclon novel coming out, I think, in March. I do. Yeah, in March, um, the novel's called A Desolation Called Peace, and it is a direct sequel to A Memory Called Empire, um, though it might be possible to read alone, like as a standalone, but probably less fun. Um, <laughs> Collect them all, folks. Yeah. <laughs> And it is a continuation of Mahit's story and a continuation of the stories of several other characters. Um, it has more than one point of view, which just as someone who never wrote novels before, they, I, I mean, Memory was the first novel I ever wrote. So I had only written a novel with one point of view. Learning to write a novel with multiple points of view, I know it sounds like that's like one of the basic <laughs> processes, but oh my God. <laughs> Hmm. Um, all right, so we're pretty much out of time. Um, do you have any, uh, just any final thoughts or, or any other projects you want to mention? Um, the other project that I'm working on right now is a novella, which will be published by Subterranean Press in just about a year from now, August 2021. I'm finishing it up right now. Um, and that is called Rose House. And it is a architectural murder mystery. Um, with the weird AI. So I guess that's what I get out of thinking a lot about passive solar houses and why you shouldn't <laughs> have the internet of things in your house. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, don't have the internet of things in your house. Just all of you people listening, don't do that. <laughs> it, it, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yes, we're going to wrap things up there. And I, I really enjoyed this book. This is my favorite kind of science fiction, I think, where you get to really go into a, you know, sort of a future society that's different from our society and just see things and, you know, from a different perspective. And I thought it was done really, really well in this book. Um, and just, yeah, the, I, I really liked the characters and this, this great sort of political thriller. We didn't really talk about the plot too much, which I guess is good because there's no spoilers. But, um, yeah, if you like... Uh, yeah, political thrillers and space opera and stuff. You got to check out this book. It's really the good. The plot's a Le Carré novel. I mean, if that if if you like Tinker uh, Taylor Soldier Savai, you'll like this. Yeah, basically. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, so again, it's called "A Memory Called Empire" by Arkady Martin. So Arkady, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Arkady Martin for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.